Right, we have a former BMP leader and former Euro Parliament MP Nick Griffin, as veteran and nationalist as they come, joined by his Australian counterpart, Australia First President Jim Salem. Our topic, the Western media's concoction of alarmism over Ukraine, the continuing demonisation of of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Essentially, NATO wishes to assert its right to create an inverse Cuban missile crisis by parking warheads on Russia's doorstep and are most displeased that Russia regards this as impertinence. The West appears to be clamouring for war, yet uh, beware what you wish for, since this may be the opportunity communist China wishes to seize Taiwan. Thus, the Western elites will have confected the perfect storm of a third world war. But that's not going to happen. And given that the Clinton, Obama, Big Pharma, corporate, global cabal pulling Biden's demented strings have an albatross for a puppet and a Western power in rigor mortis, now may not be the right time to be pretending to the role of the world's sheriff. Now, your thoughts, gentlemen. Nick first. Oh, well, obviously, it's a it's a huge topic uh, and one which I think the public as a, as a whole basically haven't really begun to grasp uh, because one way or another, they're still, of course, up with the, uh, the pandemic uh, problems and uh, all the issues arising from that. Uh, so where do we start? I suppose you can connect the two, actually, that uh, the elites I think, have realised they've got a tiger by the tail uh, in terms of uh, public response to uh, the whole COVID uh, agenda. Uh, I don't know if you saw Bill Gates last week uh, was speaking at some symposium and he said that we completely underestimated, we've taken a surprise by the degree of public loss of trust in the politicians and the media and so on over this. So they've got something of a crisis there and traditionally whether it's empires or plutocracies or so-called democracies or whatever, the people in charge of a country uh, when they have a crisis at home, what do they do? They provo provoke a crisis at war uh, and they look, if they don't actually want war, they want at least the drumbeat of war because it takes the eye of the masses off the ball at home. And I think at least part of it, because of course lots of other issues you've got, um, just as you've got big pharma and the, the this COVID pandemic, uh, so when it comes to wars and rumours of wars, you've got the military industrial complex. So always follow the money, of course. So there's all these different reasons pushing for um, the drumbeat of war, uh, as your introduction suggested. Uh, I don't think it's sensible for uh, the West to think, well, we're going to make this a shooting war. Uh, I don't think probably they want that. Uh, but whether they do or not, they, of course, run the risk of getting it. Uh, I was uh, somewhat intrigued by the fact that the uh, Ukrainian uh, puppet president Zelensky uh, didn't want to play the game. Mm, and yep. uh, he uh, he came out and suggested that uh, some of the modelling put up by the United States was not true. Um, there, there's no doubt that uh, what took place in Ukraine, say from 2013 forward, was, was a putsch, a coup to install in, in Kiev a, a government that was much more amenable to NATO, EEC and uh, other US interests. And uh, I don't believe recently, uh, I think it was last week, uh, someone in Ukraine, they published an enormous list of about 180,000 persons who they said were politically unreliable in Ukraine. Now, admittedly, the relationship between Great Russia and Little Russia, between Russia and Ukraine, has always been, it's had issues to it, it's always been problematical. Yeah. But I, I find it rather hard to believe that uh, although Russia may mismanage uh, a lot of its behaviour, that there is in Ukraine a desire for war with Russia. I, I don't believe there is. And, but this government that's been installed there, this Biden connected government may indeed attempt to incite it. So we have a lot of forces that, that are pushing towards some sort of confrontation. Now, the last thing is, I don't think the media's reports that the fact that Russia has forces training close to the Ukrainian border, that they're actually going to attack. Weeks have gone by, these forces have been there and there's no attack. Now, if there is no attack, and I don't really believe that there will be, 
The media, of course, as we all know here, never self-corrects. It never says, oh, well, we got that one wrong. They simply move to the next engineered crisis to hope to push the right buttons uh, to get that confrontation. Uh, and I, I do believe that uh, whatever else can be said for Putin's uh, system, and it does have many, many flaws and faults within it, I don't believe that the Putin system uh, desires war. But is this no. strictly strategic? I mean, on, on one hand, you know, they're, uh, you know, uh, mooting the threat of, of Russia uh, moving into Ukraine strategy but is it about strategy or does it have something uh a wider significance to the global economic cabal well I, the, the the first thing to consider as uh, jim mentioned there the way in which the ukrainian president is saying whoa, whoa, hold on here a minute it's not as bad as all this i think the ukrainians or at least some of them are beginning to realize uh despite their uh, hostility to Russia for you know, various various reasons. Despite that, they begin to realise that when NATO in general and especially the Americans are saying, well, yeah, we're going to probably have a war, there's going to be a war, uh, and we'll give you all the help you need, uh, and uh, if it happens, there'll be devastating sanctions against Russia, yeah. and we're not going to come and fight for you. I think the Ukrainians might now be beginning to understand that the Americans will fight this war to the last Ukrainian, <laughs> and it's not really very attractive. Uh, and then, of course, I think in terms of the, um, well, you mentioned the, you know, the, the media role again. So I've seen comments, particularly on the uh, the Saker blog. I don't know if you look at that. It's done mm -hmm. by a, 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 a Russian who lives in the United States, or part Russian who lives in the US. Very, usually, very, very well informed. And there's commentators on there, Martin up in particular, saying that uh, the Western images of bases showing these huge arrays of Russian tanks and so on just across the border are actually in at least some cases showing bases which are hundreds of miles away, which are always, have always been there. So uh, as usual, we've got the, you know, the weapons of mass destruction or the, uh, the babies being tipped out of incubators uh, or the, the Tonkin incident uh, or the uh, Belgian babies being tossed onto bayonets uh, or the, the ship uh, being sunk in Havana Harbor. You know, yeah. As usual, we've got the, uh, the the media simply telling lies to make things appear worse than they are, partly because it's what the politicians, of course, want, uh, and the media and the politicians are all intertwined. And also, I guess, traditionally, it sells papers. So you've got, you know, you, you've got that factor there. And I think probably the biggest factor of all in this, and one where we get the giveaway when the whole of the West, uh, the West, or rather the USA's Western puppets, are saying that if, in effect, if we can poke Russia enough so that there's a war, the result will be, we're not going to fight, don't worry, the result will be devastating sanctions. Devastating sanctions is really code word for shutting off Nord Stream 2, which is the, the big new pipeline built between direct, between Russia and Germany. Uh, and the devastating sanctions on Russia would actually be more devastating to Germany and, and to the West, because Russia is already under sanctions. They've got used to sanctions. They've worked very, very hard in recent years to establish uh, you know, alternative systems of all sorts and alternative markets, especially working with China. And if the devastating sanction turns off the gas to Europe, then the, Ru the Russians will simply sell the gas to the Chinese. Uh, you know, so uh, it's I think a lot of this, it's the, the, the hidden part of this and not that well hidden is that this is more to do with uh, America wanting to hurt a competitor, i.e. Germany, and also if the Germans and hence the Europeans can't get Russian gas, where will they get their gas? Because the coal power stations have been closed down, the nuclear power stations have been closed down. We're relying largely on very unreliable wind and solar power backed up by gas turbine uh, power stations, and if we can't, if they can't get the gas from Russia, they will have to import the liquefied natural gas, some of which comes from Qatar, but most of it would come from the United States, and that's really, really important because just as uh, the 2008 financial crisis was really sparked by the problem of some subprime mortgage lending, so the whole of the uh, liquefied natural gas industry in the United States is based on the fracking industry. I don't know if you know that for all the fuss about it, uh, and fracking has 
produced, turned around America's gas production. They produced vast amounts of gas, but fracking is so inefficient and expensive that they're producing this gas, they constantly have produced this gas at more than they're able to sell it for, with the result that the subprime mortgage scandal is going to be dwarfed by the subprime fracking scandal because there's vast, uh, incomprehensible amounts of money have been sunk into the fracking industry to produce gas in the USA. And it's a nightmare of unrepayable debt. And if they can force Germany in particular, but Russia, but Europe in general, Western Europe in general, to buy American gas, they will put off that new subprime disaster from happening. There's the possibility, uh, the mad possibility, the concept of regime change in Russia, whereby you gain access to the resources of Siberia to give money value to the US currency and whatever, which is worthless. This, this endless extension of the boundaries of the EEC and NATO into Eastern Europe, a lot of these uh, regimes, many of the uh, people who staff them, uh, to use the phrase, returned there from the United States after the collapse of the old communism. A lot of the people involved in Baltic politics and Ukrainian politics were all really Americans who happened yeah. to have Ukrainian surnames or Lithuanian surnames and as good capitalists they uh, migrated to these countries to play a role in their politics. They're, they're no more uh, Latvian and Ukrainian as uh, I'm Swiss. So it, it's a very uh, false thing. Also too, um, I get the distinct impression Ukraine's assets are also quite vast. And uh, this attempt to uh, co-op Ukraine, well, Russia by detaching some of the coal-based areas and whatnot, mm -hmm. proclaiming them as people's republics and whatnot, uh, might have uh, diminished some of Ukraine's uh, assets. But uh, even so, Ukraine is not a poor country. And uh, maybe uh, we have to look at the fact that we're seeing a certain collapse of global capitalism. Uh, it's not even a question of going to war necessarily, it's an attempt to acquire assets. And uh, at the start of the conversation, um, linkage was made between the Ukraine crisis and China's posturing over, over Taiwan. And uh, speaking uh, about this, uh, they're, they're saying, speculating in the media, that if Putin is able to get away with this terrible outrage against Ukraine, then China might make its move to uh, actually deal with Taiwan. Um, I, as I said before, I don't believe that uh, global war is imminent, but from a scenario point of view, uh, that part of it may in fact have a certain, let's just say, element of truth. Uh, China looks for advantage here and uh, China looks to a resolution of what it considers the Taiwan problem. Uh, if China were to do that, uh, it would actually cause probably global capitalism to collapse, or at least in the short term, it would bring on uh, depression, not, not recession, depression. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, if, uh, if, if, if not, if not there, if I just interject for a moment in Taiwan, because it's the overwhelmingly where the entire West gets their microprocessors from, yeah. and that alone would cause an economic catastrophe. So, yeah, there's big, big, big stakes here. Indeed, and uh, I was just sorry. But wouldn't now be the perfect time to do it? I mean, America's got. Um, you know, naughty for a, a president. It is. I mean, it's epochal the amount of uh, the lie that the system is based on. This this puppet presents the perfect time to poke, uh, you know, the bald headed eagle. I mean, what are they going to do? They got. Um, they're more interested in what sort of g strings their transsexual officers where in the Navy, uh, you know, they've commissioned, they have commissioned reports into the war readiness of the Navy, etc., and found that wokeness has essentially crippled its combat uh, ability at the moment. So, you know, if you were um, a sharp tool uh, in, you know, communist uh, China, now the West is ailing badly. And in fact, yes. it's my contention that the Amer America is bordering on its second civil war. It cannot sustain the hypocrisy that it has on its shoulders right now. Yeah. 
Yes, um, well, many, many issues there, actually. Well, I've got, I'm getting a little, lot of feedback here. Are you OK sound-wise at your end? Yeah, was that a plane or something, Jim? I don't know what that was. Not, Could not have been. End. Mm. Yeah, OK, it's, it's, it's gone now, anyway. Um, so, yeah, where to start on that? Uh, one thing you mentioned, Nathan, there about, you know, the uh, what, what colour frilly knickers they're, <laughs> they're wearing in the US <laughs> Navy. Uh, that, that actually brings us to a factor which is, I think, seriously important here, uh, that... Uh, you know, you think in terms of interest groups who, you know, poke for confrontation and there's the traditional ones which we've you know, talked about. There's, you know, there's big capitalism, there's politicians wanting to uh, draw attention somewhere else of the military industrial complex. But we've also now got in the West a very powerful new bloc, you know, the Zionist one as well. There's a new and very powerful and inherently hysterical bloc, and that's the LGBTQ lobby. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's the the particularly the homosexual mafia now has such enormous power throughout the west especially these elements that really decide well we want to push for war or we don't you know the, the political elite and the media uh, and these people are hysterical in their hatred of putin and russia and also for that matter of china uh, because they tend to i don't think they, they can't help themselves they tend to view everything through this one prism that whereas Many, many, there's a great deal of criticism uh, of uh, Jews for always viewing things through the prism of, is this good for Israel? Uh, and with homosexuals, there's, they tend to view things, powerful homosexuals, can't help themselves, but view things through the pr prism of, how do these people view people like me? And is it good for homosexuals and for LGBTQ plus liberation? And so there's that also pushing for this confrontation against Russia and China. And I don't think they really want war, but they possibly want, is this a, a rerun, the idea that, uh, because as Jim said, they want, desperately want, for reasons of money, but also this psychological problem, they want regime change in not just China, not just Russia, but also China as well. And they got regime change, in the old playbook, they got regime change in the Soviet Union to a significant extent by forcing the Soviet Union to engage in uh, an arms race, which because of its much smaller economic capacity, it lost. And I think this is, they don't want war with Russia, but if they can force Putin to do, to put so much money and effort uh, into uh, the into the military side, that people get uh, disgruntled at home, then they can overthrow him, or because he's, get, he's getting on a bit now, uh, at the very least, uh, perhaps hope that when he goes, there won't be, uh, there'll, there'll be sufficient lack of prestige for his way of doing things, that they can then change Russia, because as Jim said, they want Russia because global capitalism, it's so exhausted uh, vast parts of the world and there's so much debt that it's quite possible, they think, uh, that being able to grab fully and again the assets of Russia will kick the can of depletion and all the rest of it further down the road. Well, they're welcome to go and fight it. You know, it, it will yeah. be the terrifying sight of all these men in dresses staring down Putin's elite. Well, it's a horrible concept. In the case of like the the way the uh, the system is lining up its uh, its opponents, uh, obviously uh, China is no uh, no friend of ours either. But uh, the hysteria in Australia today. Yeah. It, it was the Australian nationalists and other similar groups that raised the issue of China's penetration of Australia uh, from uh, particularly, say, about 2010 on. It became a catastrophe here. Land, businesses, agriculture, everything was sold. Overseas students by the bucket load and, uh, and so on. And uh, the Liberal Party, which is our equivalent of uh, your Tories, uh, was all for it, you know. It was all business. Mm -hmm. They 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 even sold the uh, the port of Darwin to a Chinese corporation. And uh, uh, irony of ironies, the uh, security guards of the uh, Chinese corporation were actually a company of the People's Liberation Army. So we actually had the PLA guarding the wharves in in Darwin. But uh, they, they they did all this. And now, of course, they've changed their mind. Now they're saying that uh, the Chinese are bullies and they're, they're all these things, which, of course, in itself is, is naturally quite true. But they, they've now converted over to this and they're looking for a new axis of evil. 
So they're mm -hmm. saying that a certain modus vivendi that exists between Moscow and Peking at the moment over certain global issues shows there's an alliance. And of course, they're friendly with the government in Iran, which is also another big bogeyman in the Middle East and, uh, and so on. So they've now got an axis of evil uh, for the allied powers to, to go to war against. Um, I, I obviously think uh, uh, in Australia's case, we're looking for armed neutrality. But yep. uh, what do you think the reaction is on the ground amongst Europeans to this, uh, what you described before as a drumbeat of war? Do you think uh, people in Europe are looking towards neutrality as well? What are they looking for? I, overall, overwhelmingly, the public, if you can actually get, if you, if you put this to them, or where people do, because not everyone's an idiot, so people do think about these things. And it's the same as with basically every war that comes up. People don't want to fight it. You know, it's, it's not just the Americans who were, you know, who historically are isolationist. People don't want to fight wars for their governments, for the super rich, against people, you know, whether it's next door or further afield. Uh, and the, the default position is, uh, you're not sending my son, you're not taking my taxes to pay for that. And it's still the case, uh, which, which is, of course is why when the one elite or another wants a war, or at least wants the drumbeat of war because one way or another they, they perceive it as in their interest, they have to push so much propaganda because naturally people don't want to go and fight. So they have to be wound up to fight. Uh, and there's certainly no appetite, I don't think, anywhere in the West for fighting Russia. Nobody wants that. Absolutely yeah, I, nobody. It, it's an it. Sorry, Nick, go on. There's, there's much more innate racist hostility, as it were, towards the Chinese. Uh, and I, for, I don't know, for various reasons. But one thing, they're a lot further. So there's the idea that, well, if we're fighting them, we'll be fighting over there, you know, instead of fighting over here. I think there's a subconscious feeling that, uh, for historic reasons, you know, Russia's got huge numbers of nuclear missiles and they'll come here, whereas the Chinese are still fairly backward. And, you know, and again, we can, there can be a, a war over there. It won't affect us directly. And then, of course, really importantly, in the last couple of years, especially with people on the frankly moronic right, uh, the, uh, the knee jerk followers of Trump at his worst moments, there's, oh, it's Kung Flu. You know, it's the, uh, it's the Chinese did, did this to us. Uh, the Chinese let this loose, uh, whether or not it was deliberate, uh, and we should make the Chinese pay. So there'd be some enthusiasm and a lot more enthusiasm for confrontation with China than there would be with Russia. Even, and partly in the end, because people don't understand that really you cannot confront one without confronting the other, because both of them understand that uh, the West in the past has tried to pick off one. But if they pick off one, the other one goes next. And what you've actually got with the, especially the One Belt, One Road uh, trade and more operation now is I think that you, we're seeing the rise of China as the motor, but Russia perhaps as the military hard end. China, Russia and Iran and other places as well in the, the Eurasian continent, basically taking back what is historically their role as the centre of the world and the Western world, which has been based since 1945 at the very, very latest around the United States is, you know, geopolitically becoming the island off the coast of the world. And I think we're this in the end, historically, this will all be seen as part of the, the switchover pains from one world hegemony to another. And whether you like it or not, that's where we're going to go. Uh, Britain has the luxury, really, we could to a degree stay out of this. I do feel for the for Australian nationalists who've got the problem that you know, China is there. China in this, relatively speaking, China and Russia, let's face it, they are the innocent parties. But the biggest innocent party is on your doorstep and that innocent party uh, poses obviously one way or another, in many ways probably, a threat to Chinese sovereignty. You know, it's, for the Chinese it's a giant and very tempting quarry, I think. Sat, you know, just, sat just around the corner. And as you say, the only way, you know, you were saying, Jim, that the, uh, you know, the, the Liberal Party, the, the Australian Conservatives uh, have encouraged basically the Chinese takeover, all of a sudden seem to have realised what they've done. Uh, and the Australian nationalist position, I know for a long, long time, has been armed neutrality. Like it has to be in an ideal world, armed nuclear neutrality or something mm -hmm. else equally devastating, because you can't beat the Chinese in a shooting war. 
That's not really obvious. So you have to have enough of a, of, of a clout to really make them understand that uh, Australia is a very good trading past, partner uh, and could easily be squashed. But squashing Australia would be too expensive a thing to do. There is a. Uh, Can I just uh, take a couple of points? And that is, you, you said before about the Kung flu. Well, as we know from revealed uh, documents, that um, well, they should be the Americans should be looking a little closer to home for the uh, for, for, for for the brewing of that virus because uh, Fauci had been. Um, what, what was it, Jim? You read that was a Derpa, a, a group called Derpa. A, a homeland uh, defence based uh, yeah, yeah, research group. mob, yeah. yeah, and he wanted yeah. them researching into, uh, uh, you know, uh, add, adding traits to viruses. Yeah, yes. so, gain, they, gain, gain of function, isn't it? Gain, gain of, of function. function that's it. Yeah, gain of function, and they refused. Uh, so obviously, he went to Beijing, and I happen to have read that Australia was involved in there somewhere. Yeah, um, now, as to so that's that's just for the buy and buy. I'll think, I think I think you'll find that that flu. And I've got my own cynical Joe Rogan conspiracy type views about that. I think it happens to tie in so beautifully with the Davos agenda, which isn't a conspiracy at all because it's up there for anyone oh, yeah, who cares. It's bloody cool to read it. You know, they yeah. hide it in plain sight. But um, as to um, uh. Uh, uh, the position of the uh, conservatives turning. Well, it's funny how it turned at exactly the, the moment that the five eyes wanted it to turn. Yeah. Australia never does anything. It never has an independent opinion at all. It has to be dictated from uh, by, by, by the uh, US and uh, its axis of evil. And I would say that... Uh, the most toxic relationship Australia has and the biggest threat is bloody America. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, I think so, absolutely. The only caveat I put on that, uh, viewing it from you know, here in Britain, is that there have been a number of instances in recent years when the, the real push for America to do her worst and to, uh, you know, to, to really throw her weight around and confront Russia and all the rest of it, the push for this very often seems to come from Britain, it comes from Whitehall, from MI6. Uh, and there have been, been a number of instances when it's very easy for us, especially for me as a Brit, to you know, blame the Americans. But there have been a number of instances when the Americans, the, the best example in recent years uh, was the, uh, uh, the fake poison gas attack in Syria, uh, which was used obviously to push uh, uh, America towards war in Syria on behalf of all the usual suspects <laughs> and that came from the British intelligence mm -hmm. so it's very simple easy for us as Brits and perhaps even slightly for Australians with the old British connection to blame the Americans but sometimes the Americans are being pushed by British military intelligence i.e. the British dark state yes well well, they're all part of the five eyes so. yeah, they all yeah. I, I was going to add too that, uh, like in Australia's case, uh, Australia's argument is with uh, Chinese imperialism in Australia. It can't be an argument necessarily that if China has a uh, an issue with Taiwan or some other state, that uh, that issue necessarily involves Australia. It, it certainly involves our elite because their trade, their money, and everything flows through Taipei. Therefore, if President Xi was to do something to undermine that, he's undermining them. But from an Australian point of view, if China decided to attack Taiwan, that would be China's business. But an interesting aside, uh, the role that Taiwan or Taiwanese politics has played in Australia, even going back to the time of the change of our traditional immigration policy in the 1960s, a lot of that came out of South Korea, uh, Taiwan, and to a lesser extent, Japan. The Taiwanese were heavily involved in uh, anti-communist groups in Australia that said, look, the main the main issue is communism and not your ethnic and cultural mm -hmm. makeup. And they yeah. pushed for that. And they found a lot of uh, Australian conservative type uh, people who went along with this. Uh, it's not a question of seeking any form of grand historical revenge against Taiwan, but it's a simple recognition that Taiwan has never really been a true friend uh, of Australia. 
Uh, there's still an office of the Guomin Dang in Sydney, by the way. They, they've got the, uh, the picture of Chiang Kai-shek on the wall and you can go past it and see it, you know. And a lot of the, uh, the Chinese community here are, of course, many of them, you know, followers of Taiwan, but more and more are, of course, followers of mainland China. But it also suggests to me a very interesting thing um, that uh, if Australia is seeking armed, armed neutrality and uh, distance from China in Australia, uh, a change of uh, government here or in the nationalist direction, uh, Australia has no reason whatsoever to, I'll say, oppose uh, Chinese demands on Taiwan. It uh, doesn't mean to say you get involved in it, it simply means that you've got no real reason to oppose it. Can and, I just um, say, one thing that Nick mentioned that is crucial uh, in any forecast about that is the semiconductor, the microchip. Um, now, at the moment, China is not at the uh, mm -hmm. capability of, of manufacturing technologically uh, or otherwise. They'll catch up, but if they get Taiwan, that means we would have to buy every little chip that's coded into any bit of advanced it, 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 military it, it, it hardware. Also, or, it also means that if the, if the silly buggers actually did uh, seriously attack Taiwan, it would take a generation for them to digest it. Well, see, what I people mean, don't uh, understand uh, is domestically oh. in China, there is a reluctance to that because of the hangover of the one child policy. Yeah, the, now, these children have to take care of their elders. They're a little bit more right. com com committed than the Western uh, counterparts. They look after their elders. It's possibly the only virtue they can boast, but they <laughs> do. Virtue. So it's not just a matter of sending off a soldier to die. It's no. the backlash, and we know how people power no. can uh, erode a uh, oh, look, it would be a China when, when it gets no. pissed off. Yeah, it would be a dangerous proposition. There's no doubt about that. I wasn't suggesting it was anything else, but oh no, I wasn't but, suggesting. Uh, you were suggesting. No, I'm, no, I'm certainly not. I'm merely saying that it's an historical question that sits there. It demands, from their point of view, resolution. They've never given up the idea, and I doubt they ever will. And, it's their uh, backyard. And it's their it's, backyard. Yeah, for the last thousand years, it's been made up yeah. of southern Chinese uh, pouring Immigrants. across. Yeah. And, and, right. and I mean, it, it's such a multi tribal, multilingual, multi racial yeah. uh, little spot. But of itself, it won't be too easy for the, for the oh, Chinese no. to take by all. force because of Not its. At all. Uh, you know, geographical structure. Not at all. But it, it, it is interesting how we see linkages now between questions on the other side of the world. And the media has clearly made the link between Ukraine and Taiwan. But on the basis of bad dictators planning to attack small places. Now, we're not saying the regime in Peking is any sort of lovely place because it obviously isn't. In fact, it's a danger, I would say, to humanity, including in the long term to Russia too. But it's interesting that the media makes that claim. Oh, and, the bloody uh, media. <laughs> and the media. The media is all over it like a rash, you know. And uh, they're saying, well, you know, you can't let these bad dictators get away with this anymore. Then you can allow the Iranian Navy to patrol up, patrol up and down the Straits of Hormuz. You can't have that either. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a call to obviously restrict other states. And this is something I'm seeing in the media. There's no questioning of what Russia's actual rights are in Eastern Europe. And uh, I suppose Russia has particular rights. According to some commentators in Australia, which I found quite remarkable, uh, they actually said that uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the US system made a promise yeah. that they wouldn't extend NATO eastwards. Uh, and yet it's, 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 it's more than that, Jim. It's more than that. When they were discussing the uh, specifically the reunification of Germany, which was based on the withdrawal of Soviet troops. The, the key part of the agreement when that was decided and it was agreed that would be done, NATO pledged in writing that uh, the uh, that NATO would not be expanded eastwards, that in return for the Russians withdrawing hundreds of miles, uh, and letting the countries that have been part of the, the Soviet bloc go theoretically independent, how independent you are in the European Union is another matter, um, <laughs> in return for that, that uh, NATO would not expand westwards and would not move its missiles, uh, sorry, eastwards, and would not move its missiles eastwards. And that 
pledge is obviously be completely broken. And when you consider that NATO has a, a long-standing policy of the first use of nuclear weapons as a legitimate way of waging war, then of course the Russians cannot possibly accept now having uh, American missiles, uh, whether the, whether the uh, warheads there at the time are nuclear or not, because they can be so easily adapted and changed, they cannot possibly accept Ukraine being part of NATO and uh, American missiles being on Russia's doorstep. Yet Russia hasn't started a war with anybody, basically. Russia, except po possibly with the Turks over Crimea and the, the Black Sea and so on, the, uh, and so on. But apart from that, Russia has historically is the punch bag for aggressive West and quite often, for that matter, racist Western powers coming in and launching existential attacks on Russia. And that's always been on the basis that the war is in Russia. And having lost, what, 23 million people in the last war, I think it's now understandable the Russians have made, clearly made a decision. We are not fighting the next war in Russia. If you want to fight a war with us, it's going to be on your turf. So when you add to that the fact that all Russia has taken from Ukraine is Crimea, which Khrushchev gave to Ukraine. So it's, and it's absolutely a strategic asset and everybody there, I think the vote was 98% in the referendum for unification with Russia. And similarly in Donbass, you look at, just simply look at the map of uh, Ukraine in terms of the linguistic boundaries. Yes. And the Donbass states and so on, are basically simply Russian. So under all rules of international law, such as it exists and pure common sense and humanity, of course, those places should be part of Russia especially when the Zion-Nazi regime uh, that the West imposed uh, in Kiev was literally sending death squads into those towns and villages and murdering people because they're, they're Russian speakers no, you know, for no other reason. So in the case of what's going on in Ukraine, I would say that it's quite unusual because usually in wars and the run-up to wars, you've got wrong on both sides. In this case, I put my neck on the line and say Russia is 100% right and justified. And uh, that, there's a risk, of course, involved in that because the Russians have made it very, very clear that if there is a shooting war, they won't just be going for Russia, for Ukrainian troops. They'll be going for their commanders and for the command centers, which includes Brussels and London. So, you know, I, I'm well aware that if it becomes a shooting war, the Russians could well devastate the center of London. I still say that where we are now, that they are 100 percent in the right. And if the war comes, it will be entirely our fault and we have to take the pain that goes with it, um, which is quite a radical position for a British nationalist. If I, if, if I can now move on and slightly play, play devil's advocate on the Chinese position, because obviously I understand how for you, because you near know, Jim, for, for decades, you know, we've occasionally been in touch and always there. Um, there's the, the problem that oh, China. Uh, Australia has mm. with China. But look at the position realistically. The division between, between China and Taiwan is not much, it doesn't much predate the division of Germany. And it's a purely artificial political division and it cannot possibly stand in the long term. Correct. And yes, at present, the Chinese are behind the Taiwanese in the microprocessors. Uh, and uh, as Nathan said, so if the Chinese swallow up um, Taiwan, then we'll all be, have to buy microprocessors from China. We buy everything else from China. What bloody <laughs> difference is it going to make? Seriously, the China is going to get if they don't get Taiwan, they will get their own microprocessing uh, uh, capacity and so on in any case. So I would say that our reliance upon if you if you don't want to be if you don't want to be reliant on China, then you have to have a massive uh, and hugely expensive and very painful campaign of uh, creating you know, in, uh, your own industries and so on of genuine national protectionism, uh, which I would, I would respectfully suggest Australia is not really capable of. The whole, it would be a massively expensive thing for America to do, let, let, let alone for Australia to do it. So therefore, it's unrealistic. And the best that Australian nationalists can really aim for is to main, and ensure that ethnically and culturally Australia remains Australia uh, and that it, she has a sufficiently big stick of weapons of mass, mass destruction that everybody, particularly China, leaves her alone. 
But other than that, you have to accept that there's going to be this very big, very powerful, in effect, neighbour. And the best way to deal with that neighbour is not constantly poke, 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 scratch your eyes out. It's to actually go along with things. I believe the best thing for the West to do is to say to China, right, it's obviously you're going to get Taiwan. You want Taiwan. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, despite the, the moat between the two, I reckon if the Chinese invade Taiwan, they will take it within 24 hours and be very, very easy. The Taiwanese will not fight against being taken over by China any more than the Hong Kong did, the Hong Kong people did. It'd be a simple walkover. Given that that's inevitable, one way or another, it's going to happen. The best thing for the West will be to say to China, right, we understand your position here. OK, we'll help you take Taiwan peacefully. And in return, we're going to negotiate and then look at the things which are seriously worrying and negotiate and do that. That's the say, it's devil's advocate, but I think it's a damn sight better than allowing this thing to uh, to fester and be something that the media and the people in the West who want at least a drumbeat in, of war can do the same thing against China as they're doing against Russia, as they did, as they've done against Iran, as they did against Iraq, as they did against Germany, as they always bloody do. Yeah, well, being involved in a war to protect Taiwanese independence is not in the Australian national interest. That's beyond any doubt. The the misuse of Australian military personnel is well known uh, from the Vietnam War and then back through time, all the Zio wars that we fought in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, I don't think in Australia there is any particular public support for going to war against uh, China to support global trade any more than there is any. We have a phrase in Australia, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but we, we call it the pub test. It means can you go into a hotel and discuss a political issue with people and survive the hectoring and harassment that you get? The the point with it is that uh, in all my pub testing, I've never really found many Australians who regard uh, Putin's Russia as any sort of enemy of Australia. I can't find anybody. And yet we're told quite reliably, you know, that uh, uh, the people have woken up to the fact that uh, Russia is the new Nazi state that needs to be dealt with and so on. But outside of the uh, the elites, that view doesn't mm. hold. Now, obviously, China, as you said, different position. There are genuine issues of contention between Australia and China. But uh, I believe, playing devil's advocate here, there is the potential to persuade Australians that any argument we've had with China is one based here. If China seeks to purchase our, our water assets or mm. our uh, uh, rural properties or our port or anything along these lines, well, that's an issue between us and China that must yeah, be resolved absolutely. in an Australian way. But sending the military even into uh, the Pacific to challenge China is not necessarily what we Australians need to be doing. Uh, like if you could go back, say, 80 years to when Australia was actually threatened by Imperial Japan, uh, the furthest lines of Australian defence were taken to be in Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. Australia had a League of Nations mandate over Papua New Guinea. We were there anyway. But uh, Australia's immediate interests were here. And as you know, the big argument between the Australian Prime Minister and Winston Churchill over soldiers and troops and all this sort of thing that went on showed that Australia's uh, immediate threat uh, was here. The enemy was here. Uh, the enemy was not uh, on the plains of India, or he wasn't somewhere else. Yeah, but Australia, I think that the um, paranoia is about them coming here. Uh, well, true. It is about but, them coming here, and I'm sorry, but I find a degree of naivety in the uh, in adopting a sort of benign um, oh, attitude benign. to China. No, no not no. from you. I'm just saying in no. general from this no. topic because. No. That presupposes that there's a certain reasonableness to China's aspirations and to the methods they will employ to get those. Those aspirations are global. That's not simply some um, well, bit well, of propaganda. Let, 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 me play, uh, let me play devil's advocate here on an old, an old uh, historical question and uh, uh, no insult at all intended against our friends from uh, countries like Poland or anywhere else. But uh, if the Second World War could have been solved, by a shocking partition of Poland between the Soviet Union and the Nazis, and that was the absolute end of the war, and that was it, then uh, that's how history works. And uh, in Australia's case, a, a uh, takeover of, uh, of Taiwan uh, by the Red Chinese, if, if it took them a couple of generations to sort that out, within a couple of generations, the Western world, the European world, Australia may be completely different kettles of fish. We 
pray so. And therefore, the idea of Chinese intervention in Australia itself may become impossible. As Nick said, if Australia actually becomes a power that uh, does indeed have weapons of mass destruction, it may make that a very unpalatable thing to do. I, I don't think any nationalist uh, would be naive to the exercise of power by, by China. I mean, look at Tibet. I mean, China's never showed any particular, uh, uh, you know, warm, fluffy, heartfelt feelings towards the colonisation of Tibet. Or if I was a Muslim living in Xinjiang, I wouldn't feel too nice about it either. Uh, they or they, even they don't have many China. safe spaces. Yet. No, they don't. No safe <laughs> spaces for your gay and lesbian task forces. It doesn't happen. But uh, in in Hong Kong, even the Chinese promised that you know they were going to have a 50-year slow integration system. They got to be about what does it think about 22 years, and suddenly it all sped up. And uh, they decided no, we're going to push this a lot quicker and a lot faster. But no one denies that Hong Kong was was Chinese territory. It, it, it was uh, a loose, a colonial loose, can't be denied. Yeah. Uh, as, as Nick pointed out, uh, Taiwan, China is a little bit like East West Germany, something imposed by the Cold War and the circumstances of the time. So I, I don't think as an Australian nationalist, I'd be naive to believe that uh, President Jing's, uh, Xi is a nice bloke. I don't think I could accept that in any way, shape or form. Uh, but I do believe that uh, as long as he's removed from here, uh, he's a little bit of a toothless tiger here. And uh, as long as Australia's defences were true and correct. That's, that's the point, because if we're so change. tied at the hip with the bloody USA, yeah, and, if, and, and they're wonderful, at, as Nick said, starting wars and uh, leaving other people to finish them. Um, <laughs> well, let's I, say this. I could China. see that the uh, reparations for China would be to divide the bloody country between them and the US. That, that's the great fear that uh, uh, sits in the back of my mind that uh, it's not impossible that one of the tickets out of global war between those two superpowers is the partition of Australia. It's it's not an impossible thing. It is not an impossible thing. But that uh, that thing may uh, rest on other factors in, in global politics that might mitigate against that, uh, which is the uh, issued perhaps with Russia and uh, the contention between it and the so-called West. You may get a, what would you call it, a balance of terror, a balance of fear, a balance of something that uh, there for the grace of God goes a place like Australia. And uh, well, you never know. It's one of those things, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I think there should be a, a bugle sounding round, right about now. The mass call up. <laughs> so, can I just ask you guys, or you blokes, what do you, what is your opinion on uh, Vladimir Putin to, to, as nationalist? Um, I think that he is, obviously he, he has his flaws and, and the biggest flaw probably is that he was, he's operating almost one remarkably, one remarkable man operating in almost a vacuum. So a lot of his flaws are based on what's practical to him. He's a stupendously effective, genuine, real politician and statesman. Uh, and real statesmen and real politicians uh, work, accept and work with uh, what's possible instead of trying to do things which are impossible. And most of the people, when especially hardline nationalists in the West, you look at him and say he's wrong here and he's wrong there. That's because of the things he has to do, because he recognises reality. But when you look, in the end, you must judge a politician, any politician, not by what they say, not even necessarily by what happens when they're at their height, but in terms of their long term impact on their country. And Putin quite simply, simply took over a Russia, which was an international basket case, which had a catastrophic fall, not just in living standards, uh, but uh, in the, uh, uh, the average life expectancy. And Putin has turned all that around. And he's made, he's turned Russia back into a superpower. Uh, he's, although there's still problems with corruption and all the rest of it, although how on earth anyone in the West dares to worry yeah, about yeah. corruption somewhere else? You know, I do not know. The sheer short what's part of it is amazing. Uh, but he's done remarkable things for Russia. And as a Russian nationalist, you would expect him simply to, you know, to only, and he, he really, he, you would think he should only concentrate on Russia and so on. But you look at his role in, uh, in Syria, whereby he stepped in and blocked uh, the most 
wicked and most dangerous move yet of the entire global Zio elite. He, he killed it dead. Uh, so I would regard the man, for all that he's not a hardcore racial nationalist, clearly, but again, that's logical because Russia has never been an ethno-Russian state. It's always been a multicultural empire. It has to be. It's his very nature. And anyone who goes against that is actually threatening the basis of Russia surviving as a serious you know, large state. So although he's not a racial nationalist, uh, he's not exactly one of us, I regard him as a providential politician uh, and statesman and the great figure of the first part of the 21st century. I'd have to agree with that. I, one thing uh, that I think sums that up is that he's a historically minded uh, leader. Uh, there's that great quote that's attributed to him where he said that the greatest disaster uh, for the Russian people early in the 20th century was the formation of the Soviet Union. And the next major disaster for the mm. Russian people was the dissolution of the Soviet yeah. Union. Uh, I think he understood that uh, the Soviet Union uh, more more flaws than you can poke the proverbial stick at, but it exercised a, uh, a an enormous reach. It was a geopolitical reality that cemented an element of East European power. It was disintegrated uh, in many ways. We know that story, and it ended up therefore being a disaster. And we now live with the disaster of the destruction of something whose formation was a disaster in the first place. And uh, he he understood, I think, that. Uh, the tool that's used to always bring Russia down uh, is never uh, an invasion. Uh, the Germans tried that, that didn't work. Uh, the First World War, there was an invasion, that didn't work. It's, it's disintegrating Russia from within. Mm -hmm. And there, there's always mechanisms to do that. We know that uh, Parvis, Helfand persuaded the Germans to finance Lenin. We know that, uh, again, uh, even Hitler had an opportunity to bring down Stalin and missed it. But uh, the colour revolutions that, that mm. were caused in, in parts of the former Soviet Union, like Georgia and others, uh, showed that that's the mechanism. And I think Putin's onto it. He's 100 percent onto it. He knows how it works because it's a simple twist on the old communist logic of guerrilla insurgency. It's not that hard, not a, an enormous leap for him to understand how this works. So uh, the fact that he's been able to thwart it. I think shows that he's uh, not only as Nick's described a, a statesman, he's also a very practical person. He's tough as nails. He was a major in the former KGB. Uh, he's no he's no vestal virgin, and I think that that's what makes him a, a major uh, new world order type uh, type opponent. I agree with Nick. Doesn't make him always a good man. There's many problems with Russia. He's certainly not always uh, on the camp of uh, Euro nationalists or any of us. But he is no enemy of ours either. 100% he's not. And uh, I think the average person in the street doesn't see him that way either. In fact, I think I've actually heard uh, uh, dumb Aussie say, if this bloke had migrate to Australia and become a citizen, we'd elect him prime minister. And, uh, <laughs> I've I, seen I, I, Britain many times. Many times, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of sympathy for him as a human being. So I think that's the uh, uh, a reasonable way between what Nick and I have been saying to understanding. He's been making very good commentaries on the current um, psychosis of the West, hasn't he, in, in, in regards to uh, men uh, identifying as unicorns and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. You know, none of that washes with uh, Vlad. No, none no. of it washes. So, look, I might just ask, um, Nick, can you give us a breakdown on domestic affairs in, 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 in the old dart? Oh, What's, ve uh, ve ve very briefly, because I guess we're fairly near the end of the show now. Yeah, we are. Uh, so um, everything in Britain now is focused, of course, on uh, the Boris Johnson regime being under such enormous self-inflicted pressure. Uh, and here you've got the... It hasn't offended me that they had parties in number 10 uh, and they didn't take the rules seriously because I didn't take the rules seriously. Uh, but it's offended millions upon millions of Brits and the ones who, the more seriously people took the rules, you know, and the most serious were the ones who accepted uh, that they couldn't see their parents or grandparents or whatever as they died in hospital. They died alone in hospital. The more seriously people took the rules, the more angry they are with Boris Johnson. Uh, and the sheer arrogance and nerve and stupidity of what they did with the party gate and so on 
uh, also you know, marks him out simply as unfit to govern, unfit to do anything. But on top of that, you've got the fact that the whole of the the media elite, especially who were all pro pro uh, Europe, they were all Remainers. They hate Boris Johnson because he became the figurehead uh, that got us out. There's question marks really over that, but that's mm. you're not worth going into. Just perceptually, he's the man who got Brexit done. So they hate him and they want to bring him down. Uh, and he deserves to be brought down because uh, you know, it's the the sheer incompetent stupidity. And if if they finally been, if they've been caught out stealing a hundred million dollars, you know, hundred million pounds, you can understand why someone might want to steal a hundred million pounds. But why someone would risk everything just to have a party? <laughs> you know, it's just it's unbelievably stupid. And I think now uh, the, the only reason he might survive is that the people who really want him out which is the handful of conservative MPs and ministers who might take his place. They don't want him out yet because we've got elections coming up, local elections coming up in May and the Conservative Party is going to be obliterated. And they would rather Boris Johnson is in power until theoretically in power because he's not anymore. He's a lame duck. They'd rather he was in power until after those May elections so they don't get the blame. But everybody else wants Johnson gone yesterday, including many Conservative MPs. So even though it's not their seats on the line in May, it's their councillors' seats in their constituency. And if they go, they lose a lot of money, they lose boots on the ground, they lose campaigning ability. So therefore, the Remainers want Johnson out, the Labour Party, all the rest of them want Johnson out. The mass media want Johnson out, and apart from anything else, it's a good story. The British people want Johnson out, and most of his MPs want Johnson out. So I'll be quite surprised if Johnson is still there in two weeks. Uh, and beyond that, it's all, uh, it's quite amusing to watch. It is, of course, smoke and mirrors and nonsense, because it's not as if he's some uniquely evil man crazed in his opposition to Vladimir Putin, desire for war, etc., etc. The ones who will replace him will be exactly the same, because they come from the same field, they're run and owned by the same people, they're influenced by the same crackpot ideas. So it's all very exciting to watch, but in the end, nothing is going to change and we will continue to go to hell in a handcart. He is the archetype uh, upper, upper class tweet of the oh, year, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> He's got a slightly inbred thing about him that I... Uh, Inbred with a horse, perhaps. A, a, a oh, that's that's the creature running New Zealand. Come on, be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, <laughs> teeth um, running her family. Well, look, gentlemen, this has been uh, a lively chat. This has been a very edifying chat, and I look forward to uh, to us uh, doing it again. Um, I will. Uh, I'll say good night to you both. And. Oh,